Hello everyone and welcome back. In this video, I want to provide an overview of how you can deploy a web app and more specifically a Python Flask app to the cloud, to the web so that others can use it. So far in this video series, I've been showing you how to set up a Flask app to run locally for development. The theme of this Flask app is deploying a decision tree model via a predict API endpoint so that clients can provide values for four attributes, level, language, tweets, and PhD, and get a prediction back about whether someone with these four attribute values interviewed well or not. I've constructed a simple tree to do this, and in a previous video, we wrote some code in order to traverse the tree, get a prediction from this predict interviews well function, and then package up that prediction as a JSON object and return that JSON object with status code 200 to a client. If anything goes wrong, we were simply returning this air string and returning 400 to denote a bad request. I've got some client code over here in interviewpredictor.py, which tests out the Flask app running on localhost by providing values for those four attributes in the query string, and then it parses out the JSON response to get the prediction. All right, so I'm gonna start by taking some notes down here in main about deployment. So I wanna provide an overview of how we can deploy this Flask app while you know, talking about some specifics of how to do it, but also talking general enough that you could generalize the knowledge you're gonna learn in this video to other apps beyond say, just deploying machine learning models or beyond say, uh, Flask apps in Python. All right, so let's start super generally then. There are two main categories of deployment for a web app. So the first one is hosting your own server that runs the web app. So imagine you've got some hardware, it's running in your house, maybe in the basement where it's cool, it's connected to your home network, and it's got a public IP address where others, if they know the IP address, can make a request to your box, to your system, via the IP address and an API request. Now, if you also own, say, a domain name, like, for example, genasprint.com, google.com, apple.com, etc., then you could give those who you want to use your API the domain name, and they can use that instead of the IP address of your server. That's much more convenient for your clients because it's much easier to remember, say, google.com than it is to remember an IP address that's of a form that looks like this. All right, so that's the first option. You've got your own hardware, you're gonna host your own server out of your house or out of your small business or whatnot. The other approach, which is uh, increasingly more common, is use a cloud provider. So there are a lot of cloud providers out there. Uh, some of the notable ones include uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, Microsoft's Azure. Uh, we're gonna use uh, Salesforce's Heroku uh, in some of the demos today or in this video, uh, DigitalOcean, et cetera. There are lots of them. And essentially with this second approach, using a cloud provider, you are going to not use your own hardware. You are going to use the hardware and software from another company, another organization. And you're gonna essentially pay for their compute power, right? You get a virtual machine, you want to have it host your web app, you're gonna to have to pay to use those resources. Thankfully, a lot of these cloud providers have free tiers, like for example, uh, Heroku, which we're gonna use in the demo today. Heroku has a free tier where you can essentially deploy your app for free, but it's not going to be you know, production grade. Uh, and I'll explain that here momentarily. All right, like I said now, I think twice, <laughs> we're gonna use Heroku uh, for our deployment. 
Uh, not because I'm endorsing it as better or worse than any of the other ones, uh, because we're gonna use it because it's what's known as a backend as a service. This is a B-A-A-S, a backend as a service, which means that it's gonna provide the backend for your app, meaning the infrastructure for hosting and security and maintenance, et cetera, as a service, which means it's going to do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. It's going to abstract a lot of the details for server setup, server maintenance, and server security. And because of that, we're gonna be able to get our web app hosted pretty quickly compared to some of these other options that don't abstract those details, but do give you the control that in many cases you need. So of course there's a trade-off there. Convenience for control. All right, next. <laughs> there are quite a few ways to deploy a Flask app to Heroku. I'm gonna provide an overview of all of the different ways. And then in this video, I'm gonna provide a demo of one of the ways. And then I plan to make another video or maybe more than one uh, showing some of the other approaches because they all have their merits and they all have their drawbacks. And which one you decide to use is really up to you and your preferences and you know what software engineering or software development tools you're familiar with or you wanna use for your project. All right, so let's start with the two major breakdown of categories or the two categories uh, that these different ways break down into initially. All right, so first, deploy the app directly on an Ubuntu stack. And I'm putting the word stack in double quotes because this is a Heroku term, which generally represents the operating system image that is used to run your app, right? So our Flask app has to run on some operating system that has Python installed. What operating system is that? That's your stack. So the default stack for Heroku is Ubuntu, which is uh, you know, one of the most popular free and open source Linux distributions out there. So it makes sense for Heroku's default stack or operating system image to be Ubuntu. In order to do approach number one, you have to declare two files. The first is what's called a proc file, and this is used by Heroku in order to figure out how do I deploy your app. And the second one is specific for what's called uh, the Python build pack, which is declaring all of your Python dependencies in a file called requirements.txt. The second approach is to deploy the app indirectly, uh, meaning deploy the app as a Docker container on a container stack. If you haven't worked with Docker before, I would encourage you to take a look at it. It's a really great service for running your apps as lightweight containers, where all of the dependencies for your app are packaged up into the container. It makes your apps really portable and a lot of cloud providers like AWS, Azure, Heroku, etc., provide support for running Docker containers where everything is included in the container that needs to be included to run your app. In order to do this, you need to declare what's known as a Docker file, which is essentially a build specification for a Docker image. We are going to do an example in this video of approach number one. In subsequent videos, I'd like to show examples of approach number two. There are quite a few ways to expand approach number two. I'm gonna list them here uh, for those of you who are curious, but I'm not going to do the demo or demos for these different approaches in this particular video. So this is just for those of you who are interested. The first two approaches, I'll call them uh, 2A and 2B. These are official approaches that are currently listed on the Heroku website. 
So when you go to Heroku, uh, let's say Heroku deploy Docker container, and you click on deploying with Docker, these are going to be the two approaches that Heroku is going to list. Heroku provides two ways for you to deploy your app with Docker, one with a container registry and two with building your Docker image with Heroku.yaml. All right, so 2A is build a Docker image locally and push the image to a container registry. And specifically talking about Heroku, I'll put here Heroku's registry. Okay, if you wanna read about how to do this, uh, beyond what I might include here as a brief description. Uh, take a look at this first link on devcenter.heroku.com slash category slash deploying with Docker. 2B is uh, build your Docker images with heroku.yaml for deployment to Heroku. So my brief expansion on that in the notes here is with 2B, instead of building a Docker image locally, you are going to excuse me, you're going to define a heroku.yaml file and push your source code to Heroku's remote Git repository. And then Heroku is going to read that YAML file, which contains instructions for how to build your web app. And Heroku is going to build the Docker image and register it. So if you haven't worked with Docker before, uh, the details between 2A and 2B uh, may seem kind of convoluted, but here's the big picture. 2A, you're gonna use your own compute resources on your local machine to build the image. Okay, this could be a several gigabyte file. And then you're gonna push that several gigabyte file to Heroku and Heroku is gonna deploy that image as a container. With 2B, you're not gonna build that Docker image locally. You're just gonna push your source code which includes the Docker file for how to build the Docker image, and then a heroku.yaml file, which is gonna tell Heroku, hey, here's how you build my app, build an image based on the Docker file, and you're gonna have Heroku use its compute resources in order to build the image. And then, of course, Heroku, once the image is built, is going to register the image with its registry, and it's going to deploy the image as a container and your app will be deployed. Uh, just a little bit more details about these uh, registry and register words here. Uh, if you've ever been to uh, Docker Hub, then you visited a container registry before. It's essentially a site or a service that registers, meaning stores and keeps track of different tags for your Docker images. So those Docker images have gotta be hosted somewhere and they're hosted and kept track of in what's called, uh, what's called a container registry. All right, so those are the two official approaches to two. Now I'm gonna put here 2C, okay? 2C is kind of a fun one, kind of an unofficial one, where you define what's called a main.yaml file and you push your source code to GitHub and a GitHub action builds the image and pushes the image to the container registry, e.g. Heroku's registry. So what's so cool about GitHub actions? These are essentially definitions for processes that run on GitHub to do things like build your code, clone your code, uh, test your code, deploy your code. And someone, in fact, quite a few someones, there are different GitHub actions to do this. Someone out there has built and released a GitHub action that when you push to GitHub, takes this main.yaml file, reads through it, sees, okay, what are your dependencies, you know, what's your Docker file called? How do you build your image, et cetera? And builds your image using a GitHub action and then pushes that image to Heroku in order to deploy your app. So what's cool about 2C is you just push to GitHub and then GitHub pushes the image to Heroku. 
So imagine kind of like a triangle where the leg from your local machine to Heroku is non-existent. You go through GitHub in order to get there. Pretty cool. All right, enough with the notes. Let's do approach number one, kind of the traditional non-Docker approach. All right, let's start with requirements.txt. So typically, if you're using a virtual environment in Python or you're using pip, you declare all of your requirements for your project or your app, your Python requirements to be specific, in a special file called requirements.txt. So let's create this requirements.txt. So in requirements.txt, you simply list out all of your dependencies. So I'm gonna look at my interview app at the top and I need Pickle. Pickle is a standard library. I don't need to pip install it in order to run this application as long as Python's installed. Uh, but Flask is not a standard library. So I'm going to specify that Flask is a dependency. And those are the only two import statements I have. My interview predictor does use requests in JSON, but I'm not gonna be calling my interview predictor when I deploy my server. This is just client utility code. I can optionally put a version in here so if I want, I could say flask equal equal, and then the version of flask that I'm running like 1.0.2, but I don't have to do this. This is good to do so that if there's upgrades to flask on the Ubuntu stack, right? Remember, go back to the notes here. So with approach number one, okay, we're gonna be using the Ubuntu stack, which means it's going to have a version of Python installed. It's going to pip install everything in our requirements.txt. And if that version of Python is updated on the Ubuntu stack, then we could get a newer version of Flask, which could break something that we're using. So it is good to put a version number in here. You can get the version number by simply going to your terminal, running Python, importing flask and then printing out flask dot version. Oh, it looks like I'm actually running a newer version than I thought. So 1.1.2. And this way we'll be using the same version on Heroku that we tested with locally. All right, so that's all I need in my requirements.txt. If you have other dependencies, you should put them here. Next, I need a proc file. So the proc file is used by Heroku in order to know how to build your application and what are you trying to deploy. It can automatically figure out that you're using Python because of requirements.txt. That's a very Pythonically named file. And it'll appropriately install what's called the Python build pack. But from there, it needs to know with this requirements.txt, what are you trying to build? So I'm gonna say in my proc file, I'm trying to build a web app. And here's the command to launch my web app. Python, so invoke the Python interpreter, passing in the name of my module that starts my app. So that's interviewapp.py. This guy right here that's got my Flask app. This is essentially the same command we were using to run our Flask app from command line. So now what I'm gonna do is head over to Google Chrome and go to heroku.com. If you're not already signed in to Heroku, you should sign in now. This will bring you to your dashboard, dashboard.heroku.com. Recall that I'm running a free tier account, which means I can have up to five free dinos. And a dino is essentially a container for an app. The container can have a stack, which could be an Ubuntu stack, or it could have a Docker container stack, but I can only have five of these dynos, okay? Five of these dynos. And each of the dynos in the free tier goes to sleep after 30 minutes of inactivity. 
So you can see I've got four dinos here and they're all four asleep. They've got the little Z's here, okay? Once a request, uh, like web traffic request is made to one of these dinos, they'll wake up. Uh, they're a little slow to wake up because they're free dinos. But once they're awake, they'll stay awake for uh, 30 minutes or so, and then they'll fall back asleep if they don't get any uh, activity or request. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new app. Okay, I'm going to give this a unique name. Okay, this is going to be the subdomain of the URL that my clients will use when they want to make API requests to my interview Flask app. So I'm going to call it interview app dash Gina. You can see I already had a few there, so I've got to name them uniquely. Uh, so I'll just slap my first name on the end here. You should put uh, something identifying uh, for your app on the end. Uh, I'm going to take this one here and choose the region wherever you are. I'm in the US, so I'm going to leave that at United States. And then I'm going to click Create App. All right. Let's scroll down a bit on this dashboard for this app and see where it says deployment method. Okay, there are three options for deployment method. Heroku Git using the Heroku CLI, GitHub connect to GitHub, and container registry using the Heroku CLI. So Heroku Git and container registry, I describe both of these using uh, 2A and 2B, okay? For Heroku Git, you don't have to use a Docker container. You could push to uh, Heroku because Heroku has its own uh, Git repository service, so you could push to it as a remote. I'm going to show you how to do this in another video when I do 2B. Okay, We'll do it with the Docker file instead of the proc file in order to deploy a Docker container, but you'll see an example of this one with 2B. 2A is going to be shown uh, for the container registry. And then right now with number one, we're going to do GitHub integration. So I'm going to click on GitHub, connect to GitHub. And now it says connect this app to GitHub to enable code diffs and deploys. Search for a repository to connect to. Okay. So what I need to do is I need to take this project that's on my local machine push it up to GitHub, and then search for that GitHub repo in order to connect the two. So let's do that. So I'm going to do git status, confirm this is not a local git repo, git init to initialize it as a local git repo, git add dash a to add everything. I should probably put a docket ignore file in here, but it's fine for this demo. And then I'm going to make my first commit. And now I want to add a remote for a GitHub repo. So I'm going to head over to github.com slash dsprint23. That's my personal account. I'll make a new repository. I'll call this API service fun GitHub integration. I'll make it public. Sure, why not? Okay, I'm going to copy this URL. I'm going to come back to my terminal and run git remote add origin, paste that URL, git push dash u origin master, and I'm going to push this entire project up to GitHub. Fantastic. Let me refresh this page here. And there it is. Great, now I can head over to Heroku and I can search my uh, personal account here. 
Uh, if you're on a team and you want to add access to Heroku for that team, you could just click this button here, ensure Heroku dashboard has team access, choose a different account or organization here. And now I'm going to search for API service. And there it is, API service fund GitHub integration. I'm going to click connect. Give it a moment as it connects. Awesome. Okay. So now it says automatic deploys enables a chosen branch to be automatically deployed to this app. Okay. Choose a branch to deploy. I only have a master branch. You might want to set up a Heroku branch or perhaps a deployment or production branch such that only when you push to that branch, are you going to have Heroku uh, clone your code and run your app and deploy it. But I'm just going to leave this as uh, master and I'm going to click enable automatic deploys. And it says automatic deploys from branch master are enabled. Every push to master will deploy a new version of this app. Deploys happen automatically. Be sure that this branch in GitHub is always in a deployable state and any tests have passed before you push. Okay, so if you do have tests like unit tests, then you should check this box to say, wait for CI to pass before deploy. I don't have any unit tests for this, so I'm going to leave this unchecked. Okay, now what I need to do is make a push, right? So let's just make a change. We are about to deploy. So I'm going to set debug to false. Okay, this to do is now resolved. And while I'm here, there's actually two more things that I'm going to have to change in order to successfully deploy this Flask app to Heroku. The first thing I have to change is I don't know at compile time right now or push time, so to speak, I don't know what the IP address is that Heroku is going to assign to my web app. It's not going to be 127.0.0.1. Okay, that always refers to localhost. It's going to be a valid public IP address. So I'm going to tell Flask that your host IP address is going to be this special address 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0, which from the server perspective or the server context means essentially all IP addresses on this network interface. Okay, so at runtime, whichever IP address is assigned to our Heroku app, that'll resolve and work just fine with our Flask app with this setting. Secondly, I need to pass in a port. When we were running Heroku, or excuse me, when we were running Flask locally, the default port was 5,000. And that worked just fine for localhost as long as you didn't already have uh, process listening on port 5000. But the way Heroku works is Heroku only opens one port for web traffic and it's going to set that port number as an environment variable, which it is our responsibility to get and set for Flask's port. So the port number that uh, Heroku is going to open up uh, for HTTPS, okay, so secure HTTP protocol is port 443. If HTTP protocol is not used, then the port will be port 80. Okay, so those are the two standard ports for web traffic coming in over HTTP port 80 or HTTPS port 443. Okay, so we're going to write good extensible code right here by querying the operating systems environment variables at runtime to get that value for port. Okay, so Heroku is going to set the value for port that our Flask app needs to bind to in order to receive web traffic. So to do this, I'm going to scroll up and import the OS module. This is the standard operating system module included with Python. And I am going to use it to get an environment variable called port. If the environment variable port is not set, then we'll use the default port 5000. So I'm going to write here, Heroku will set 
the poor environment variable for web traffic for us. Okay, so we need to set up our Heroku uh, Flask app to listen on that port or to bind to that port. This is going to work nicely because it'll still be able to run locally on port 5000 as long as you don't have a port environment variable defined on your you know, host Linux or Mac or Windows machine. Okay, so we've made some changes. We've essentially set up our app to run in what I'll call deployment mode. Okay, setting up debug to be false, the host IP address to be resolved at runtime, and the port to also be resolved at runtime based on what Heroku is going to set as an environment variable for us to use. Okay, so I'm gonna push to GitHub. And now I'm gonna scroll up in my dashboard.heroku.com slash apps and then the name of my app. And I'm gonna click on activity. And what's really cool is with that push to GitHub, Heroku was notified via what's called a webhook that a push has just occurred to a branch with automatic deploys enabled. And so you can see I've got a build in progress on my activity feed. And I can click uh, view build pro progress and I can take a look at all of the things that Heroku is doing to set up my app. So for example, it says building on the Heroku 20 stack. Okay, so the 20 here is Ubuntu uh, 20.04 long-term support. Determining which build pack to use for the app. It says Python app detected. The reason why Python app detected was detected is because of the requirements.txt. Okay, it's installing uh, a latest version of Python, Python 3.9.4, installing pip, SQLite, installing requirements with pip. Okay, so it got this flask 1.1.2 from my requirements.txt. Okay, and then it's downloading some dependencies of flask. Okay, let's keep cruising. And then it says successfully installed, discovering process types. Okay, so it's looking in my proc file. It says the proc file declares types web, compressing, launching, released. HTTPS colon slash slash interview app gina.heroku.com or herokuapp.com is deployed to Heroku. Well, that's fantastic. I could copy this URL, open a new tab, and I could also just click open app here and I will see that app. And there it is. It says, welcome to app, just like it did on my local host. But this is public. This is up there in the cloud. This has got this nice uh, interview app, Gina subdomain on the herokuapp.com domain. I could give this to folks and they could take a look at my app here. So let's try our predict endpoint. So slash predict question mark to start our query string. I think I'm going to be lazy here and just copy that whole query string and paste it and see if we can get predictions. So I got false. Let's try changing PhD from yes to no and see if we get true, which we do. So this is very exciting. We were successfully able to build our own API that represents a deployed model that was trained at a previous time in a different Python process and deploy that model as a Flask app to Heroku. It's publicly up there on the web. Folks can go use it if they want. Now remember, this is hosted on what's called a free dyno. So after 30 minutes of inactivity, this web app is gonna go to sleep, okay? It can be woken up when a request comes in, but it is gonna be a little slow to wake up. If you're a student, I would encourage you to sign up for the GitHub Student Developer Pack, which comes with a lot of uh, fun, free developer goodies. Uh, one of which is a free hobby dyno on Heroku. And with a hobby dyno, your dyno isn't gonna go to sleep like the free dynos do. So take a look at that. Uh, if you're a student and you're learning and you don't want your dynos to go to sleep, uh, take a look at the Student Developer Pack from GitHub. They've got a partnership 
with Heroku where you can get a free hobby dino that doesn't go to sleep. All right, that wasn't too much work. In fact, all we had to do was declare uh, requirements.txt in a proc file and then just do a little bit of GUI setup on Heroku and GitHub. Just to recap, this was approach number one, deploy the app directly on an Ubuntu stack. We saw that was Heroku 20, Ubuntu 20.04, by declaring a proc file in requirements.txt. In a future video, I'm going to show you how to deploy the app as a Docker container using a container stack by specifying a Docker file. So if you're interested in how to do the same thing, but using Docker, which is a very portable way to deploy and distribute your app, stay tuned for the next video. All right, that's it. Thanks for watching.